Little man, Christopher John, Claude, and I were sitting on the bottom step of the seventh grade class building after school waiting for Stacy and TJ when the front door banged open and TJ shot out and tore across the yard. What's the matter with him? asked Christopher John. Ain't he going to wait for Stacy? The rest of the seventh grade, led by little Willie Wiggins and Mo Turner, spilled from the building. There he go! cried little Willie as TJ disappeared on the forest road. Mo Turner yelled, Let's see where he going! Then he and three other boys dashed away in pursuit of TJ, but the others stood restlessly near the steps as if school had not yet ended. "'Hey, what's going on?' I asked Little Willie. "'What's everybody waiting around for?' "'Where's Stacy?' demanded Little Man. Little Willie smiled. "'Stacy's inside with Miss Logan. He got whipped today.' "'Whipped?' I cried. "'Why can't nobody whip Stacy? Who done it?' "'Your mama,' laughed Little Willie. "'Mama?' Christopher John, Little Man, and I exclaimed. Little Willie nodded. "'Yep, in front of everybody.' I swallowed hard, feeling very sorry for my older brother. It was bad enough to be whipped in front of thirty others by a teacher, but to get it by one's own mother, now that was a downright and that was downright embarrassing. Why'd Mama do that? asked Christopher John. She caught him with cheat notes during the history examination. Mama knows Stacy wouldn't cheat, I declared. Little Willie shrugged. Well, whether she knowed it or not, she showed sure enough whipped him. Of course now she gave him a chance to get out of it when he said he wasn't cheating, and she asked him how he got them cheat notes. But Stacy wouldn't tell on old TJ, and you know good and well old TJ wasn't about to say them notes was his. Cheat notes? But how'd TJ get cheat notes? Stacy got rid of them the things this morning. Come noontime, though, replied little Willie. TJ was in them woods, busy writing himself another set. Me and Mo seen him. Well, what the devil was Stacy doing with them? Well, we was in the middle of the examination, and old TJ slips out these cheat notes. Me and Clarence here was sitting right behind him, and TJ had seen the whole thing. Stacy was sitting right side of TJ, and when he seen them notes, he motioned to TJ to put him away. At first, TJ wouldn't do it, but then he seen Miss Logan starting toward him, and he slipped Stacy the notes. Well, Stacy didn't see Miss Logan coming when he took them notes, and by the time he saw her, it was too late to get rid of him. Wasn't nothing Miss Logan could do but whip him. Failed him, too. And old TJ just sat right there and ain't said a word, interjected Clarence, laughing. But knowing Stacy, I bet you old TJ ain't gonna get away with it, clucked little Willie. And TJ know it, too. That's why he lit out of here like he done. And I betcha. Hey, Stacy! Everyone turned as Stacy bounded down the steps. His square face was unsmiling, but there was no anger in his voice when he asked quietly, "'Anybody seen T.J.?' All the students answered at once, indicating that T.J. had headed west toward home, then surrounded Stacy as he started across the lawn. Christopher John, Little Man, Claude, and I followed. When we reached the crossroads, Mo Turner was waiting. T.J. went down to the Wallace store, he announced. Stacy stopped, and so did everybody else. Stacy stared past Jefferson Davis, then back down the road toward Great Faith, looking over his shoulder, and he found me and ordered, "'Cassie?' You and Christopher John and man go home. You come too, I said, afraid of where he was going. Got something to take care of first, he said, walking away. Mama gonna take care of you too, I hollered after him. You know she said we wasn't to go down there, and she find out she gonna wear you out again. Papa too. But Stacy did not come back. For a moment, little man, Christopher John, Claude, and I stood watching Stacy and the others heading swiftly northward. Then little man said, I want to see what he gonna do. I don't, declared Christopher John. Come on, I said, starting after Stacy with Little Man and Claude beside me. I don't want no whippin', objected Christopher John, standing alone in the crossroads. But when he saw that we were not coming back, he puffed to join us, grumbling all the while. The Wallace store stood almost a half mile beyond Jefferson Davis, on a triangular lot that faced the Soldier's Bridge crossroads. Once the Granger Plantation store, it had been run by the Wallaces for as long as I could remember, and most of the people within the forty-mile stretch between Smellings Creek and Strawberry shopped there. The other three corners of the crossroads were forest land, black and dense. The store consisted of a small building with a gas pump in front and a storage house in back. Beyond the store, against the forest edge, were two gray clapboard houses and a small garden, but there were no fields. The Wallaces did not farm. Stacy and the other students were standing in the doorway of the store when little man, Christopher John, Claude, and I ran up. We squeezed through so we could see inside. A man we all knew was Caleb Wallace stood behind the counter. A few other men sat around a stove playing checkers, and Jeremy's older brothers, R.W. and Melvin, who had dropped out of school long ago, leaned sleepy-eyed against the counter staring at us. "'Y'all go on back to the back,' said Caleb Wallace, "'lessen y'all want to buy something. Mr. Dewberry got the music going already.' As we turned away from the entrance, Melvin Sims said, "'Just look at all them coming to dance,' and the laughter of the men filled the room. Christopher John tugged at my arm. "'I don't like this place, Cassie. Let's go home.' "'We can't leave without Stacy,' I said." Music beckoned from the storage room, where Dewberry Wallace was playing round bottles on a small table as we crowded in. Aside from the table, there was no furniture in the room. Boxes lined the walls, and the center floor had been cleared for dancing. Several older couples from great faith were already engaged in movements I had never seen before. "'What are they doing?' asked Little Man. I shrugged. "'I guess what they call dancing.' "'There we go!' 
someone shouted as the back door of the storeroom slammed shut. Stacy turned quickly and sped to the back of the building. TJ was fleeing straight toward Soldier's Road. Stacy tore across the Wallace yard and, leaping high like a forest fox, fell upon TJ, knocking him down. The two boys rolled towards the road, each trying to keep the other's back pinned to the ground. But then Stacy, who was stronger, gained the advantage, and TJ, finding that he could not budge him, cried, hey, Wait a minute, man, let me explain! Stacy did not let him finish. Jumping up, he pulled TJ up, too, and hit him squarely in the face. TJ staggered back, holding his eyes as if he were badly hurt, and Stacy momentarily let down his guard. At that moment, TJ rammed into Stacy, forcing the fight to the ground again. Little man, Christopher John, and I, with the others, circled the fighters, chanting loudly as they rolled back and forth, punching at each other. All of us were so engrossed in the battle that no one saw a mule wagon halt on the road and a giant man step out. It wasn't until I realized that the shouting had stopped behind us and that the girls and boys beside me were falling back that I looked up. Mr. Morrison towered above us. He did not look at me or Christopher John or Little Man, although I knew he had seen us, but walked straight to the fighters and lifted a still swinging Stacy off TJ. After a long, tense moment, he said to Stacy, You and your sister and brothers get on in the wagon. We walked through the now silent crowd. Caleb and Dewberry Wallace, standing on the front porch of the store with the Simses, stared at Mr. Morrison as we passed, but Mr. Morrison looked through them as if they were not there. Stacy sat in the front of the wagon with Mr. Morrison. The rest of us climbed into the back. Now we gonna get it, shuddered Christopher John. I told y'all we should have gone on home. Before Mr. Morrison took the reins, he handed Stacy a handkerchief in which to wrap his bruised right hand. But he did not say a word, and it wasn't until we had passed the crossroads leading to great faith that silence was broken. Mr. Morrison, you gonna tell Mama? Stacy asked huskily. Mr. Morrison was very quiet, as Jack the mule clopped noisily along the dry road. "'Seems I heard your mama tell y'all not to go up to that Wallace store,' he said at last. "'Yes, sir,' said Stacy, glancing nervously at Mr. Morrison. Then he blurted out, "'But I had good reason. Ain't never no good, ain't no, ain't never no reason good enough to go disobey your mama.' The boys and I looked woefully at each other, and at my bottom, and my bottom stung from the awful thought of mama's leather strap against it. But Mr. Morrison, I cried anxiously, T.J. was hiding there because he thought Stacy would never come down there to get him. But Stacy had to go down there because T.J. was cheating and— Hush, Cassie, Stacy ordered, turning sharply around. I faltered for only a moment before deciding that my bottom was more important than Stacy's coat of honor. And Stacy had to take the blame for it. And Mama whipped him right in front of, of God and everybody. Once the truth had been disclosed, I waited with dry throat and nauseous stomach for Mr. Morrison to say something. When he did, all of us strained tensely forward. I ain't going to tell her, he said quietly. Christopher John sighed with relief. "'Ain't going down there no more, neither,' he promised. Little man and I agreed. But I, Stacy stared long and hard at Mr. Morrison. "'How come, Mr. Morrison?' he asked. "'How come you ain't going to tell Mama?' Mr. Morrison slowed, Jack, as we turned into the road leading home. "'Cause I'm leaving it up to you to tell her.' "'What?' we exclaimed together. "'Sometimes a person's got to fight,' he said slowly. "'But that store ain't the place to be doing it. "'From what I hear, folks like them Wallace's got no respect for her at all for colored folks, and they just gonna think it's funny when we fight each other. Your mama knowed them Wallaces ain't good folks, that's why she don't want y'all down there, and y'all owe it to her, and y'all self tell her, but I'm gonna leave it up to y'all to decide. Stacy nodded thoughtfully, and wound the handkerchief tighter around his wounded hand. His face was not scared, so if he could figure, his face was not scarred, so if he could figure out a way to explain the bruises on his hand to mama without lying, he was in the clear, for Mr. Morrison had not said that he had to tell her. But for some reason I could not understand, he said, All right, Mr. Morrison, I'll tell her. Boy, you crazy! I cried as Christopher John and Little Man speedily came to the same conclusion. If he did not care about his own skin, he could at least consider ours. But he seemed not to hear us, as his eyes met Mr. Morrison's, and the two of them smiled in subtle understanding, the distance between them fading. As we neared the house, Mr. Granger's Packard rolled from the dusty driveway. Mr. Morrison directed Jack to the side of the road until the big car had passed then swung the wagon back into the road center and up the drive. Big Ma was standing by the yard gate that led onto the drive, gazing across the road at the forest. Big Ma, what was Mr. Granger doing here? Stacy asked, jumping from the wagon and going to her. Little man, Christopher John, and I hopped down and followed him. Nothing, Mama replied absently, her eyes still on the forest. Just worrying me about this land again. Oh, said Stacy, his tone indicating that he considered the visit of no importance. Mr. Granger had always wanted the land. He turned and went to help Mr. Morrison. Little man and Christopher John went with him, but I remained by the gate with Big Ma. Big Ma, I said, what Mr. Granger need more land for? Don't need it, Big Ma said flatly. Got more land now than he know what to do with. Well, what's he want with ours, then? Just like to have it, that's all. Well, seems to me he's getting, he's just being greedy. You ain't gonna sell it to him, are you? Big Ma didn't answer me. Instead, she pushed open the gate and walked down the drive and across the road into the forest. I ran after her. We walked in silence down the narrow cow path which wound through the old, the old forest to the pond. As we neared the pond, the forest gaped 
open into a wide, open brown glade made man-made by the felling of many trees, some of them still on the ground. They had been cut during the summer after Mr. Anderson came from Strawberry with an offer to buy the trees. The offer was backed with a threat, and Big Ma was afraid. So Anderson's lumbermen came, chopping and sawing, destroying the fine old trees. Papa was way on the railroad then, but Mama sent Stacy for him. He returned and stopped the cutting, but not before many of the trees had already fallen. Big Ma surveyed the clearing without a word, then stepping around the rotting trees, she made her way to the pond and sat down on one of them. I sat close beside her and waited for her to speak. After a while, she shook her head and said, I'm so glad your grandpa never had to see none of this. He dearly loved these here old trees. Him and me, we used to come down here early morning, just before sun was about to set, and just sit and talk. He used to call this place a stinking spot, and he called that pond old, that pond there Caroline, after me. She smiled vaguely, but not at me. You know, I, I wasn't hardly eighteen when Paul Edward married me and brung me here. He was older than me by about eight years, and he was smart. Oh, we, oh, my lord, that was one smart man. He had himself a mind like a steel trap. Anything he'd seen done, he could do it. He had done learned carpentry back up there near Macon, Georgia, but where he was born. Born into slavery, he was. Two years before freedom come, and him and his mamma stayed on that plantation after the fighting was finished. But then when he got to be fourteen and his mamma died, he left that place and worked his way across here up to Vicksburg. That's where he met you, ain't it, Big Ma? I asked, already knowing the answer. Big Ma nodded, smiling. Show sure was. He was carpentering up there, and my papa took me in with him to Vicksburg. We was getting tenant farming about thirty miles from there to see about getting a store-bought rocker for my mamma, and there was old Pa Edward working in that furniture shop just as big. He had himself a good job, but that old job wasn't what he wanted. He wanted himself some land. Kept on, kept on talking about land, and then this place come up for sale, and he bought himself two hundred acres, acres from that Yankee, didn't he? Big Ma chuckled. That man went right on over to see Mr. Hollenbeck and said, Mr. Hollenbeck, I understand you've got land to sell and I'd be interested in buying me about 200 acres if your price is right. Old Mr. Hollenbeck questioned him good about where he was going to get the money to pay him, but Pa Edward just said, don't seem to me it's your worry about how I'm going to get the money just as long as you get paid your price. Did nothing to scare that man. She beamed proudly and Mr. Hollenbeck went on and let him have it. Of course, now he was just about as eager to sell this land as Paul Edward was to buy it. He had it going on nine on nigh twenty years, bought it during Reconstruction from the Grangers, because they didn't have no money to pay their taxes. Not only didn't have tax money, didn't have no money at all. That war left them plumb broke. Their old Confederate money wasn't worth nothing, and both Northern and Southern soldiers had done ransack their place. Them Grangers didn't have nothing but the land they left, and they had to sell two thousand acres of it to get money to pay them taxes and rebuild the rest of it. And that Yankee bought the whole two thousand. Then he turned around and tried to sell it back to him, huh, Big Ma? Show sure did, but not till eighty seven when your grandpa bought himself that two hundred acres, and as I hears it, that Yankee offered to sell all two thousand acres back to Harlan Granger's daddy for less than the land was worth. But that old Fillmore Granger was just about as tight with a penny as anybody ever lived, and he wouldn't buy it back then. So Mr. Hollenbach just let other folks know he was selling, and it didn't take long for sold all of it, because it was some mighty fine land. Besides, your grandpa and a bunch of other small farmers brought up eight hundred acres, and Mr. Jameson bought the rest. But that wasn't our Mr. Jameson, I supplied knowingly. That was his daddy. Charles Jameson was his name, Big Ma said. A fine old gentleman, too. He was a good neighbor, and he always treated us fair, just like his son. The Jamesons was what folks called Old South from up in Vicksburg, and as I understands it, before the war they had as much money as anybody, and even after the war they managed better than some folks, because they had made themselves some northern money. And anyways, old Mr. Jameson got into his mind that he wanted to farm, and he moved his family from Vicksburg down in here. Mr. Wade Jameson wasn't about eight years old then. But he didn't like to farm, I said. Oh, he liked it all right, just wasn't ever much hand at it, though, and after he went up north to law school and all, he just felt he ought to practice his law. Is that how come he sold Grandpa them other two hundred acres? Show sure is, and it was mighty good of him to do it, too. My Paul Edward had been eyeing that two hundred acres since 1910 when he'd done paid off the bank for them first two hundred, but old Mr. Jameson didn't want to sell. About the same time, Harlan Granger come ahead of the Granger plantation, you know, him and Wade Jameson about the same year's children, and he wanted to buy back every inch of land that he used to belong to the Grangers. That man crazy about anything that was before that war, and he wanted his land to be every bit like it was then. Already had more than 4,000 acres, but he's just itching to have it back. The mother 2,000 his granddaddy sold. Got back 800 of them, too, from the mother farmers that bought from Mr. Hollenbeck. But Grandpa told an old Mr. Jameson wasn't interested in selling, period, was they, Big Ma? They didn't care how much money Mr. Granger offered them, I declared with an empathetic nod. 